So we're driving Miss Dave. <laughs> That's good. And we're grateful that Dave's with us. Uh, can't go there because I'll start crying. Who else we have? Go ahead. I'm James Alton, K7DEV. K7DEV. Okay. Thank you. And? I'm Kendall Sawyer. I have been just taking I'm Kendall Sawyer. I've been just taking the technician classes on Zoom. Cool. All right. Kendall, we're going to have a new tech here with our uh, with our next exam session, I'm sure. I guess I'm new to this club. I'm Chad Rapier. I'm K7FJM. Used to live in Layton. Got married and moved away years ago. But just went back to Layton again, so good to be here. Good to see you again, Chad. Yes? So I'm Carl Romine. Um, I'm six in MP. And I'm part of the area. Cool. Thank you for being with us all. Do we have any new, newly licensed operators with us today? Any upgrades from the last time we met? Okay. Now remember, first Wednesday, next month, we're having an exam session right here. And uh, if, you have, if you'd like to do an upgrade and you haven't, you're welcome to. Mike, need a few minutes for field day. We're going to try and keep this short so we can get right to Rick. Uh, winter field day, we've mentioned it a few times. The club's participated the last uh, couple of years. We will be participating uh, in the snow this year. Uh, unless bunches of it melts this next week. But uh, it is out uh, west. Uh, the address is on the website. Look it up. Um, we're keeping track of how many people will be there for dinner. Uh, the club is just providing some hot dogs. We'll barbecue them up and you bring in a small dish to share with the dozen of us that will be staying for dinner. Uh, but you're welcome to come by during the afternoon. Uh, show up at around 10 for setting stuff up and we'll be taking everything down right after dinner. But we'll be there throughout the day. Uh, you just made that sound terrible. Uh, we're going to be providing hot dogs. Hot dogs. We're, we're going to do a hot dog bar. Okay, we're going to have hot dogs and stuff to put on them. <laughs> <laughs> so, that hot dog bar sounds like you're going to saute them in vodka or something. I can do that if that's what you want. I'll do two. But uh, we will be, um, yeah, this is out of my, uh, if you've been out there before, it's out of my mother-in-law's place. Um, same place last few times. Right? Same place as the last few times we've done it. Uh, it's real easy to get to, so you know there shouldn't be any problems. And uh, uh, she's already excited about. It. I don't know why she gets so she doesn't come down and join us, but she's just happy to have people out there using the property. So. And it's not really in the snow. <laughs> right. No. no. We're not going to we'll be, be out in the snow. <coughs> yeah. We have had in the past some trailers, but we have a pole barn that we'll be using. And it is enclosed. It's not an open It's pole enclosed, barn. and we'll have some heaters in there, so it's, we should be able to get at least the chill off the air, so a jacket should work and, and stuff like that. And it's got power and, yeah. So just real quick, by show of hands, how many think they'd like to show up for a hot dog bar? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, thirteen, about a baker's dozen. Mm -hmm. We'll get a couple extras. So, 27th, out in uh, out in the field out west. Uh, Gary, tell us real quick what's happening next month. The next month is show and tell. So bring the things you've made or things you want to show next month. We'll be here, right? Right here. Probably right in this room. Yeah, I think... Um, I think for the most part we're going to be in this room. There was a couple of dates that she wasn't sure of, but because we were on the schedule first, uh, she's going to try and give us priority. So. And everybody bring a Slim Jim with you, would you? Uh, <laughs> just, just in case. Excuse the parking lot. <laughs> Mel, you got a message for us. Yeah. First, I want to, uh, I'm Mel Parks with the Utah VHF Society. 
I'd like to let all of you know that we're doing something different this year for the Utah VHF Society, if you haven't already heard. Please don't go to our normal place for the swap meet the last weekend of February. The swap meet this year will be the last weekend of March, that's the 30th of March, and our bylaws require us to have a business meeting before the 1st of March. So we have made an agreement with the Digital Communications Conference that will be on the 3rd of February to have our business meeting at the conclusion of their event. The Digital Communications Conference is a real great conference to get a lot of good info about the latest and greatest things going on in ham radio, and we will be doing a VHF Society presentation there also. So put it on your calendar. If you don't know anything about it, just do a Google on Digital Communications Conference. It's going to be at 94 South in Salt Lake at the Larry Miller Salt Lake campus. And uh, there'll be a number of really good items to, you know, different seminars and events that'll be going on there. Does anybody have any questions about the VHF Society or that? I would just like to reach out to all of you and say thank you for all of your support as members of the VHF Society. We've had a real challenging year this year, and we've had to put in almost $15,000 into different repeater projects all over the state of Utah, and it was your dues and donations that really helped us. So all I can say is thank you, thank you, thank you. We really appreciate it. And if you aren't a member, consider signing up and joining. Uh, we're not arm twisters. We want everybody to use the inner tie system. The inner tie system now has a permanent link into Phoenix that's in operational all the time now. And so if you have buddies down there in anywhere in the Phoenix area, you can talk all the way from uh, Utah down into the Phoenix area. So it's sort of a neat system that's uh, available to all hams everywhere to use. So thank you for your time and come out and join us at the Digital Communications Conference and our swap meet. Question. Can you give us an update on the new equipment that was purchased and installed? And is yes. It done yet? Uh, we were able to get a grant from the digital uh, amateur digital communications group, and they gave us quite a sizable grant of a hundred thousand, hundred and sixty thousand dollars. And we were able to buy new Motorola radios, brand new repeater radios, that we put in at Snowbird, at uh, Barnsworth Peak, uh, Blowhard down by Cedar City and Frisco Peak. And we got 20 new link radios that we've put in at most places. But because of all of our challenges last year, we haven't got them all installed yet. We have a long list of sites we've got to go visit this coming summer. If some of you would like to come along and join us and help us with some of our projects, let me know or let us know. And we'd be glad to have you join us and come out and have some fun on the mountaintop. We enjoy people to come and help us out with our repeater projects. Any other questions? Yeah. So now that there's a link to Phoenix, does that run through Vegas full time? Here's how the link to Phoenix works. Uh, the link goes through Blowhard, which is in Cedar City, and then it shoots all the way over to Navajo Mountain by Page, Arizona. Page, Arizona shoots over to uh, Flagstaff, Mount Eldon, and then Mount Eldon has a series of repeaters that go down by Prescott and then down to the Phoenix area. So there's about four or five hops to get down into the Phoenix area. And the Arizona Repeater Association have uh, provided all of that additional repeater uh, activity for us. And they did that all out of their uh, own program and made those repeaters available to tie into the intertie system. So if you enjoy it, send us an email and tell us how much you enjoyed talking to your buddies down in Phoenix. Any other questions? Thank you for your time. And with respect to uh, Las Vegas, I hear guys on there all the time. It's, it's a lot of fun. Am I still here? Okay. Faded out. Thank you to Pete for bringing some donuts. And please go eat them. <laughs> Pete doesn't want to eat them all himself, I'm sure. Uh, in, uh, we got a tradition going here of recognizing people. So Scott Willis, come up. Yeah, you. Come on. I don't bite. It's not hard anymore. Mike Fulmer. Come on.
careful. Oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they take them down. I don't know if there's anybody here who doesn't know who these two are and what they do for us. But these are our club repeater engineers. And they put in more than full time money, resources, equipment. Uh, we would not have what we have without them. And we just appreciate so much what they do. And in addition to that, because Scott has a great relationship with our Sheriff's Department, our Sheriff's Office, we have the ability to have access to things that otherwise we just wouldn't be able to do either. So we appreciate them so much. I've made a couple certificates for them. And uh, on the certificate itself, it shows the towers at Mount Ogden as well as the repeaters inside the building. There we go. Uh -oh. Need a close up here. There we are. Scott, Mike, and uh, they've just obtained Elmer's status here. There we go. So uh, I know they really won the Elmer's. They didn't care about certificates. So there, there you have it. The Elmer Fudge. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Seriously. Yes, Jolene. I just want to say how happy I am that you guys are doing that because I did my first layer six and to Moscow and I, I want to do Russia. So thank you so much. It makes me so happy and you guys all did it because I couldn't do it otherwise. Oh, you're, you. are you talking wires X? Yeah. Off the I know probably. On, yeah. on the, yeah. the one four six. Yeah. How recently was that? Pardon? How recently was that? When did you do Yesterday. It? Yesterday. I mean, well, one o'clock in the morning, but... Oh. <laughs> I thought it was only old men that could stay up all night talking and... because they couldn't sleep. No. I'd just like to make a quick comment about these two great guys. Sure. Most of us don't know how many hundreds, if not thousands of miles they put on their own personal vehicle with no compensation to take care of the repeater, and I had to do an evaluation of all of our repeater sites when we made a request for our grant, and I have to give them an idea of what it cost to operate and maintain a repeater site. And the basic cost could run you anywhere from $10,000 to $25,000, and that's what they're providing to us through the club support. So you really need to appreciate what these guys are doing for us. And I would like to say that I think the club ought to step up and support them much more than we do, quite honestly. Um, I'm going to leave that for the board meeting later on. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, you two. And uh, what Mel was alluding to was these two maintain many of the sites for our inner tie as well. Yeah. And we just appreciate that so much. For those of you, well, for all of you, I was able to procure additional 100-year patches for a club. So if you'd like one, they're five bucks. I'm going to give them to Jay for him to distribute and collect the money and everything, but I don't see him here today. But uh, we've got 60 of them here, and I can get more if I need to. It takes a little while, but uh, we were able to figure that out. All right, Rick has been patiently waiting because of all of us. But uh, Rick's one of our officers in the section, and we just appreciate him so much coming to visit with us today, and I'm going to turn it right over to you, Rick. Before I use the mic, can everybody hear me okay? No? Okay. I've never been accused of not being heard. So with your permission, and I'm going to ask the AV person, if, if can you pick up my vocals okay on that? I don't know yet. <laughs> you don't know yet? Okay. It would be a lot better with the mic. I'll use the mic then. <laughs> um, I'm going to start off by just giving you a quick anecdote. Back in August 30th of 2019, 
I received a phone call at 1.30 in the morning from a local person in Manipal, and the first thing he said, and I answered the phone because I knew who it was, the first thing he said was, are you available to help? And I said, yes, what do you need? And I was, that was the first time I was actually deployed to an actual event. And that was the gun range fire in Bountiful, which, uh, which had been started by a, by a campfire back in the day. And so I went in there and was providing radio support. And there's a lot of reasons why that happened. But the point of this and the title of my presentation is a practical approach to getting involved in your communities. And uh, so first of all, a little bit about me, So, because I know not everybody knows who I am. My name is Rick Mead, Whiskey 7, Victor, Quebec. I am still a assistant section manager for the, for the Utah section. I'm also a National Traffic System official relay station. I want to talk a little bit about that uh, down the road. I also maintain a digital station for traffic handling. And I'm a VE with both the ARL and W5YE. Um, I do some other things, and we'll talk about that as well down the road. I was initially licensed as a novice in seven, or W7, or, yep, WN7 FTW. Okay, yeah. In, um, in 1966, that's why I can't remember that. It was so darn long ago. <laughs> Got my uh, general class license the following year, and then joined the Utah National Guard, 19 Special Forces. Got to go to radio school at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, which was an experience in and of itself. I apply those skills today as an NTS. Came back, my license went away for a while, came back when I got my general as WA7 FTW. Um, at one point in time, I got back in N7 EFK, and that one went away. Anyway, the last time I finally got back into the hobby, um, I went through and, and finally took my extra class, so I had requested the W7 to be the one by two call sign, which I use today. Um, so what I want to talk with you about today is my experiences in, uh, in getting involved. What I'm going to cover is just a big, brief background of ARIES, what options you have to provide communications, my experiences, training, and some information on who to contact. So, to be an effective MCOM participant, you need to know the framework you're operating in, and there are many different ones. It is not just one. Um, you need to develop both technical and operational skills. You need to have a plan. You need to practice the plan. And you need to assess the effectiveness of both your plan and your own abilities. Every time you go out, I mean, and, I, and I've talked with people about this before, um, and also to improve, but one of the things that you need to do is you actually need to try the things that you think you're going to do in an emergency. So, for example, I've got a go box that I use. And when I first put the go box together, I didn't drive 100 miles out someplace in order to put it up and try it. The first thing I did was put it together in my backyard. See the darn thing would work. And then I would put it away. And then the next thing I did was I went to a local park and I got took everything with me that I thought that I needed and made sure that I had it. And one of the most important things to have in your go box is a notebook to remind yourself of what you wanted to have that you didn't have the last time you went out. And then go get that thing and put it in your go box uh, and make sure you've got it. I, I talked to another uh, uh, friend of mine, another ham, and one of the things that he's got, because he works out at Hill Air Force Base, is he puts one of those little red tags from the uh, that they put on the on the munitions. He puts that on his go box, and any time he takes something out to work on it, he removes that tag. And then when he puts it back in, he puts that tag back on. And that's just a reminder of him to make sure that he's got everything in there that he needs. So th those are just some of the things to uh, to think about uh, from a logistics. And 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 I'll I'll talk a little bit more about logistics. My dad was career army. He was in for 30 years, a battalion survivor. But he was a logistics officer, and that's how he got over to uh, uh, the Philippines in World War II. Uh, he was attached to the 31st uh, Philippine Regiment, and uh, as he said, when when uh, the Japanese when Bataan fell in April of 42, he became a guest of the Japanese for the remainder of the war. 
So, um, today's communication infrastructure can fail. This is a statement that's out of the EC16 course. I'm not going to read it to you. You can, you can take a look at that. But um, there's, a, there's a gentleman, Chris Fugit, who is a former uh, FEMA administrator, who made the statement that any emergency system that is dependent on an infrastructure will fail. Mel, I'm, I'm, it's still a good thing to have all of our repeaters around, but you need to think about what's going to happen when those are not working because that will happen at some point in time. So that needs to be considered. And so his view of ARIES and emergency communication support was that at the very base level, you have to be able to do what you want to do using simplex on UHF, BHF, and HF. And that's really where you need to be focusing uh, some of your skills and some of your learnings. Possible structures you can work with. Is anybody familiar with the Saturn net? Has anybody checked into that? One of the things that I do, and this is part of what I do for traffic handling, is I check into that net anytime during hurricane season because one of the things that Saturn does is they send wellness traffic for those people that are leaving the East Coast and going inbound in order to let family and friends know what is going on with them when they can't do that because all of the cell towers are overloaded or down or not working. And so that's something I check into because I can pick up that traffic. I can drop it into uh, the 12th net or local net here or the western area net and I can get that information out to uh, anybody that they need to talk with. You can volunteer directly with a group, such as the Red Cross. You can be part of an amateur radio support group, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, more about that with my specific situation in the Bountiful North Salt Lake area. And you've also got things such as the amateur radio emergency services. That's only one piece and one part of your involvement in the community. So a little background, the ARIES was started back in 1935, and if you take a look at the strategic plan, I'll give you a link to that later, it specifically talks about the mission of that is to uh, provide uh, amateur radio services, the program of the ARRL. So the American Radio Relay League is the driver for that program. They are, they are the ones that provide the guidance, and it is actually managed through your section manager and those folks um, they establish and determine how that participation is going to happen within their various sections. Uh, and it's different from state to state. <clears throat> the other thing about ARIES that's important to note, and in talking with Scott Harder here in, in Salt Lake area, or the Utah area, um, they're really looking at ARIES to be participating at the county level, state level, or uh, city level, and so forth. When you get up to the state, they're using their own, their own uh, credentialing and, and so forth, and if you take a look around at various states, what you'll find is the credentialing that they use is different from state to state, and it continues to change. Um, Oxcom has been something that's been talked about a lot, and some states are still using that. I will tell you that as far as Oxcom is concerned, that trading is excellent, and it's something worth going to because you're going to learn something as you do it. But it doesn't necessarily mean because you are credentialed through Oxcom that somebody is going to invite you into their incident to help run it or help communicate with it. And I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Again, getting back to what I talked about at the beginning of my presentation, the reason I got a phone call has nothing to do with my involvement in even radio communication. So um, just so that you know, the um, uh, ARL has memorandums of understanding with lots of different volunteer groups. Uh, and those memorandums of understanding are simply an acknowledgement between the two organizations that there's some synergy there. There's some things that can be done. But it is not a guarantee that that is going to, or that there is going to be a relationship built for a specific event. So, my experience. How did I get that phone call? I got that because initially I was working on, on providing uh, emergency preparation for my neighborhood, for my community. And I was an assistant block captain, asked to do that. And as, as part of that, I said, I really need to go and I want to finish CERT training, Community Emergency Response Team training. Once I got through that, um, I was asked by the Bountiful CERT program to become an instructor. So I went through the instructor training and I now teach CERT. I'm still doing that right now. 
I'll be teaching one of my classes on Thursday this week. Um, the other thing that I did with that was I ended up building relationships with Bountiful City. Now, North Salt Lake and Bountiful City are right next to each other. North Salt Lake does not have a robust emergency prep plan. Bountiful City does. There's probably have one of the best ones in the state with what they do. And so in getting involved with the CERT training, I also eventually was asked to participate in the Bountiful City Emergency Preparation Committee. Um, and so I do that as well. We meet the second Tuesday of every month. <clears throat> no, every, yeah, every other Tuesday. Yeah, every other Tuesday throughout the year, we change that. Um, and we run drills, literally, almost every time that we meet. So every two years, we're practicing that plan, going back to what I said before. And that's part of that participation and part of that ongoing involvement and keeping your, your tools sharpened and ready to be actually used. Because when an emergency comes, if, you haven't, if, you're, if your radio has been in a drawer collecting dust for a year, it's not going to be much use, even if it's an FRS radio. Um, so, build relationships, build your skills. As I mentioned, um, going through radio school in the military, I learned a lot about, about networks and so forth, but I still need to participate, that, uh, participate in that on a regular basis. So I check into the Beehive Net frequently. I do check into the High Noon Net frequently. I actually pass traffic on both of those nets. I check into the uh, TWN Net, which is the 12th Region Net on CW, most nights at 10 p.m., and I pick up traffic on, on CW. Um, <clears throat> your CW skills, I know that you don't need it now to get a license, but that has nothing to do with how much fun CW really is. And so what I would encourage you to do, if you, if you don't have any CW skills, take them. I'm also a member of CW Ops, and I have been an advisor and, and will continue to do that for some of their CW classes that they do um, three times a year. So you can go out to CW Ops, you can look at their, up the, their materials online there directly, um, but there's lots of opportunities to, uh, but Mel's been through their courses. Have you, are you, are you, uh, have you finished their, their, their last one yet? First one, and I want to take the second, but I'll tell you what, CW Ops, if you have any desire to learn Morse code, that is the only way to do it, in my opinion. <laughs> it works. Oh, I love that. I, that's, that that's great. That, that's, I, that kind of an endorsement is worth its weight in gold. So, um, so anyway, I would encourage you to do that. Um, just so that you know, um, when I got out of radio school, I was able to hand copy 30 words a minute. Um, I, I kind of slid off when I wasn't using it on a regular basis. When I got back in, I was at 15 and didn't like that. So that's when I went back to, uh, to CW Ops, went through their, their advanced class, and then after I did that, I, I became a, a, an advisor for them as well. And I'm now to the point where I can, I can head copy 25 pretty consistently, and I pick up traffic all the time between 25 and 30. So that, it, I'm, I'm back to I'm, my, my neurons are firing like they did when I was 19. <laughs> if, if you can believe that. Um, continue training. Participate in events because there is nothing like actually being in an event uh, to help you get an idea of what kinds of things can go wrong, what kinds of things you're going to need to know, and how well your remote operations work. <clears throat> Learn how to operate your equipment as well as agency equipment if, you, if you've been asked to do something within, within an agency. Uh, that agency equipment can be radios that are on the 800 megahertz band uh, and so forth. It can be a lot of different things. Uh, have raw materials for constructing antennas in the field. This is something that a lot of people don't think about, but if you, if you think about any de-expedition that you've ever heard about, the thing that breaks and goes down on them more often than anything else is their antennas, because they're out in the, in, the, uh, in the environment, they're out in the winds, they're going to break, they move around, they get driven over by trucks. There's all sorts of things that can happen to them, and so have raw materials for doing that. I carry spools of wire in my truck, 500 foot, so that if I ever have to, I could construct a dipole antenna without much of a problem, because I've got the connectors in there as well, and, in, and including something that you can, that you can actually solder with uh, while you're out and about. Um, consider having the ability to connect anything to anything. <laughs> This is, if, if, you've got a, if you've got a 239 and you, can, and you need an end connector and 
Having an adapter is very helpful for that. Having a lot of barrel connectors for your, for your coax is also worthwhile because you may need to stretch it for a long ways to get out to an antenna that's, uh, that's been put up in a field someplace from wherever you're actually operating. Another thing to, to do is, is participate in nets. And I know that most ARIES groups and a lot of other local groups, some of the, some of the emergency uh, uh, radio nets that are around, they meet on a pretty regular basis. People get on, they check in, and, and somebody acts as net control, and they keep track of who checks into that. Those are all good exercises, and they're things that you should participate in. But if you have an opportunity to, participate in some other nets as well. Traffic net is different than a tactical net. Is different than a liaison net, is different than a resource net, is different than lots of other nets that you're going to run into. They all require different skills and they all require a different view of, of what's important and what's not important. When you start handling traffic, you'll find that there's really four types of traffic that are out there. You've got routine traffic, you've got uh, wellness traffic, you've got priority traffic, and you've got emergency traffic. When you get into an actual event, you should only be handling priority and emergency traffic. Wellness traffic doesn't necessarily belong on a traffic net, and certainly retreat traffic doesn't either. And that's something that you need to be thoughtful about as you're, as you're participating in some of these various areas. Hey, Rick? Yes. I, I was going to make a comment that happens to us with the uh, VHF Society. We do the frequency coordination and the frequency assignments. And one thing everybody believes is that they have to have a dedicated frequency for their net. Have you ever considered trying to do three nets on the same frequency at the same time? It can be done, and it has to be thought about, because in the emergency, we have to share those frequencies. Everybody can't have their own frequency. No, and that's, and that's a great point. And, and I will just, I'll just add on this, because I go back to when I first was licensed in 66, um, that was before the VHF Society started coordinating frequencies because I can remember when the first repeater that I could hit in my area, in the Salt Lake area, went up on the mountain in order to get into Davis County. That was an exciting time. And at that point in time, I think in the northern part of the state, we had one repeater. That was it. And it's grown significantly since then because now it actually has to be coordinated. And if you go out to the, to the site and you look at the... <laughs> If I just think about my code plug and everything that I've got to drive through the state of Utah, the number of, of, of repeaters and opportunities you've got is just is just a. It, I'm I am always amazed by that. I really is because I remember the day when it wasn't. Okay, um, <clears throat> operate portable, build a go box, and build a go box not just. Especially if you're a general class or above, don't build just a go box for your for your UHF VHF, but build one for your HF rig. Um, I actually keep a uh, Kenwood um, 480 SAT in my in my in my truck as well, and I've got antennas in the back besides all of my other emergency equipment that I've got. So I could go out there right now, quite frankly, and I could set up and run HF on my uh, out of my truck. But it'd take me a minute, but I do have an antenna out there, one that I could load up. Um, something like a, a Wolf River coil or something, even something simple like that, a small vertical that you can put up to get on the air is, is great. You can also get some of the, those uh, million um, NVIS antennas for HF, which work really, really well for short duration, because you're basically using the, the um, F layer as your repeater. And, uh, and, and that becomes a, a good opportunity for, uh, for communication as well. So it's something that's, that's fun to go out and test. I was fortunate when I got my license, I was actually at the peak of Solar Cycle 19. And so I, I was able to talk on my little Heath kit that I built um, and my dipole that my dad had me put up on the roof of the house uh, quite handily. But um, uh, building things yourself and, and having experience with that is invaluable. You learn so much going through that. Contest? Pardon? the contest. Participated contest. Oh, participating contests. I did skip over that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Contests are great because they, they, they teach you about propagation. They teach you about how to pull in signals when you've got a pile up on and being able to work your filters and do other things such as that. 
Um, and uh, it, it's also a great way to just know how to be able to log a lot of things as you're going through by yourself. Um, and so um, the other thing I'll mention along with that, and thank you for reminding me to talk about contests, um, there is a different skill set between hearing Morse code, if you're looking at a CW contest, hearing Morse code and writing it down, hearing Morse code and just knowing what it says, and hearing Morse code and typing it. Each of those is a different skill set. And, and, it, and if you, even if you can copy 30 words in your head, that doesn't mean you can sit down at a mill machine, which is what the military uses in order to type. It's a, it's a typewriter that only is uppercase. But um, that's the only, that skill is different. And it's also a different skill to hear code and write it down. And you need, if you need all three of those for what you're doing on a, and having fun with, you need to practice all three of those because they are, they are in fact different. Thank you again. Um, <clears throat> NCS operations for various types of network. We talked about that a little bit because liaison nets, different than traffic nets, different than tactical nets. Most people get experience with tactical nets if they're doing a parade or something like that. But those other nets are important to participate in. And if you can get to be a, an NCS in those, um, that's even you'll even learn more with that. Uh, traffic handling, messages vary. In fact, with NTS 2.0, and I'll just mention that quickly, uh, there's some changes that are going on uh, in order to encapsulate messages. They've added some handling codes that are, uh, are additional over what they had. Um, I was talking with Craig, and if you ever want me to come back and talk specifically about traffic handling, I've got a presentation I would love to give you about that one. But um, NTS 2.0 uh, is, a, is, a, is a new piece that is being come up you can, as a matter of fact, the first letter on that was published uh, in October of last year, post newsletter that was coming out on a regular basis on, on the updates for that. Um, try different digital modes, Winlink, D-Star, N-Beams, um, JSA Call, whatever digital modes you've got access to and are being used in your local groups. They're all different. And uh, you don't necessarily need to know all of them and find out what's, what's being used in your area and become proficient with it. <clears throat> so, technical and operating skills. <clears throat> if you haven't looked at the ARIES task book, look at it. It's got a great set of plans for you in order to develop your skill set. Um, level one basically means you're gonna join an ARIES group and you're going to be aware of, uh, of um, You've got a license, technical class or both. Those are required. And, and get the cast book, join an ARIES group. Does that mean you're ready to be deployed on an incident? No, it doesn't. It's just a starting place and it's a, it's a place to begin. When you go to, when you go to uh, level two, there are some more things. Now, the ICS courses you probably talked about, 100, 200, 700, and 800, those are good introductory courses. Um, they will get you exposed to the incident command structure and the national incident management system. Um, however, as you get into it further, um, there is a lot of other education that I'm going to suggest you consider as you go through that. But there are some additional things that, uh, that you get to do. You've got uh, net participation is required. Um, be able to program a tone into your, into your HT, your handheld uh, transceiver. Uh, and so forth, and being able to do some of those things. Um, the um, solder connectors assemble a 24-hour deployment kit. 24-hour deployment kit is an interesting one to think about because I've got the ability, and I've got this in my truck right now, um, I've got all of my CERT materials back there. I've got a toolbox, I've got an antenna, I've got an HF radio. Um, I've got power that I could drive off of my truck in order to get that thing up on the air. Um, but I also have about 10 days worth of food. I've also got about 10 days worth of water. I've got a space blanket or two. I have got ponchos. I have got blankets. I have got other things so that I could actually be comfortable someplace for a week or more, no matter what happens. I would have to probably contact my wife so she didn't worry about me, but that, that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's the secondary piece of that. Um, then when you get to level three training, 
you've got ICS 100, 230, and then they have got these other ones, this, this ICS 300 and 400, um, those are optional. I would highly encourage you to go through all of those ICS courses. It's, it's, it's in a lump, it's called the Personal Development Series. You will learn a lot going through that. You will learn a ton going through 300 and 400 because what they're talking about there is what happens when an incident expands from a small one to a larger incident. And then there's other courses that are available through the MyTrain that I have also taken. Uh, the incident management team, I took the uh, logistics class. I took logistics because I think logistics is important. Quite frankly, I think that's really where the action is other than what's going on in operations. But uh, that's also where communication sits, is within the uh, logistics uh, with the, the logistics box within, within the incident command structure. There's one additional course that you'll have here that's not required in the personal training series, and this is that 2200 Basic Emergency Operations Center function. Um, when, you, when you take this training, what you do is you, you end up getting a much better sense for how what ICS really is and how it works. Um, and I'll tell you that I was talking with Brett Pruitt, who is, who is now the, uh, the Section Emergency Coordinator. He took the 300 and uh, 400 with me uh, when, he was, when we were uh, going through that. And he and I were having lunch one time and said, you know, you can take 100, 200, 700, and 800 and think you know ICS. But until you take these other courses, you really don't appreciate the, the, uh, the nuances of it and what it really takes in order to run those. I will say the same thing about the IMT now. Granted, those are these last two classes I was just talking about in the IMT, those are in person. Each one of these classes, um, one of them was three days, one of them is two days, and then the IMT is a five-day on-site course to go through. Um, but you do get some really good experience, and there's a lot of very highly trained people that are doing this on a regular basis that uh, can share their experiences, and it's, it is really uh, a learning experience for them. <clears throat> Level three, you're also getting into more leadership and proficiency skills as far as operating, getting familiar with ICS forms, the 213, and so forth. And as I mentioned, on the NTS2, Point oh version that the uh, American Radio Relay League is working on, um, they are looking at encapsulating messages so that you can use, a, uh, a, for example, the, the radiogram form and encapsulate within that an ICS-213 and do some other things. And, and if, as you know, if for those of you who are using WinLink and other digital modes, end beams and so forth, all of those forms are preloaded on those programs when you bring those up and you've got those available so that you can utilize those and keep track of what it is that you've actually done. Um, so in closing, I hope I haven't taken up too much time. I was trying to get done so we had some time to discuss this afterwards. Uh, carefully read the ARES strategic plan and the ARES manual. Commit to meeting EC16. EC16 uh, that course, that's on, that's on emergency communications, and it's the one that you, you take from, uh, from the uh, American Radio Relay League. In order to get through that one, you have to sign up for the course. You have to go through all of those ICS courses that I, that I mentioned earlier in order to take those. And then once you get done, you need to send an email off to the section manager and say, I want to take the final exam, and then uh, you'll get logged and be able to do that, and that's actually the way you complete that to get a certification for it. That course is very, very good. Uh, I would encourage you to start if you haven't taken any of those yet. Take the EC1 course first, um, now on emergency communication. There's a lot of good information there, and then I would follow it up with EC16. Um, you've heard a lot of people say when you get licensed for an amateur radio, uh, in, into the amateur radio community, it's, it's a license to learn. Um, learning is a lifetime event, and you're going to. I would encourage you to take advantage of all of these courses on a regular basis. They'll get updated too. I mean, I, since I went through that the first time, both some of those classes have been updated as many as two or three times. Um, when 2019 there was a big revision, 2011 was a previous one for CERT, for example. But they continue to update those and become more and more tied into what's going on on a regular basis. Back in the day of, of when ARIES was first started, basically ARIES had agreements with each group that they supported 
or an amateur service group or whatever at an agreement with each of the agencies they serve. Now, it really comes into whoever is running emergency um, preparedness and managing those resources at a city or a county or a state level, and they're the ones that are getting resources. It's the unified command approach, if you will, to emergency communication. So it continues to change. The structure continues to change. Some of the old structures are still in place for smaller events, but for the newer structures, it's becoming much more of a unified command, and the people responsible for running that are the ones that get to drive who gets to participate. Again, going back to the, uh, I live in North Salt Lake, but I'm part of the amount of full emergency preparedness committee, and I teach CERT through them, and that's why I've got that relationship to where I can help, and we're helping North Salt Lake along with Bountiful, along with other cities that are in that area. So, um, volunteer in your communities to do things. Um, that's all um, things that you want to consider. Think more about HF, as I mentioned before, that's going to continue to work for you when when other things are down. Mel? Uh, about the Aries Task Force, for those who don't know, how can we find it? What do we do when we find it? You go out to that website. <laughs> 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 thank you thank you for that lead into my next slide. Um, you can find the Aries Manual. Um, these are all on ARL.org files. The strategic plan is out there in the task book as well. Uh, Aries Fillable Training Task Book Version 2. And I, that, this may be an old an old slide now, but um, and I'll send you this these, this presentation, uh, Greg. You can put that out on your website, so you'll have access to that. But um, that's where you'll that's where you'll find those. Um, and and uh, again, it's a it's a matter of uh, of just taking the time and doing things. I will be so you know out on Antelope Island next weekend, talking for Winterfield Day. Um, because doing communications in the cold weather is a different animal. Now, granted, the first time I went out to Antelope Island, I didn't want to. I, I wanted to make sure my class showed that I was suffering. So I was sitting outside in a tent under, with with a radio, portable generator. Nah, I'm taking my fifth wheel out now, and I'm going to sit inside that thing. But I'm still going to make some cues out there and and know that I can run remotely because I've got my. Uh, my solar panels and my uh, and my uh, generator and my uh, lithium-ion phosphate batteries in my trailer, so I can I can run all of those things and 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 not be plugged in. Although I will have some other components of my trailer plugged in to keep me comfortable, <laughs> and uh, and that's going to have to be okay. But I, I figure it, at my age I've earned that. <laughs> so. Um, Questions. If you have anything that you want to know, uh, you can contact me there at uh, uh, w7vq at arl.net. I am proudly wearing my lifetime membership pin to the ARL, and uh, I would encourage you, if you're not members, to join. One thing I'll just add, if you've got a new member that comes in, they join through the club, the club gets money. And uh, I think it's 20 bucks, 20 bucks for a new member coming in through the club, and it is $5 for a renewal. If you've got questions about that, contact Ted Cowan. He can help you with the uh, logistics of that. Um, I've been a member of ARL anytime I've been in amateur radio, and, and it's, it's because they protect my frequencies. They're the ones that got our frequencies back after World War II when everything was shut down. So um, I would encourage you to think about that. Are they perfect? No. Are they our lobbyists? Yes, they do a good job for a number of things that they work on. So something to consider. and. Uh, and my personal opinion, that's all I can state to you, is that they're worth the, worth the money. So um, with that, any other questions, comments, thoughts, disappointments? Yes, sir. How do the alphabet soup of acronyms and courses and stuff that you mentioned, do any of those courses talk about propagation, the science of radio, uh, the rules and regs, because my general impression of all the emergency <coughs> events that I listen to, most of those people are totally clueless about that stuff. Good question, and no, they don't. And 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 here's and this is why going out and doing is the most important aspect, I think, of of what I'm trying to communicate today. Is you, you don't just you don't just go through the courses but you go out and you actually utilize them. Because 
The other advantage of contesting, I, I can remember, so when I, when I first got my license, and I had, okay, so I, I built my DX60A and my HR10, I, and that's what I was running. I had two crystals on 40 meters that I could run on, and, and that actually teaches you how to run split when you're a novice back in those days, because all you were doing was you'd listen on the frequency you had a, you had a, a crystal on, and you would send out CQ, sit there with my Morse code key, down in my basement, my dad's basement, and <clears throat> send out CQ, and then you'd have to span the band to see if somebody was calling you back. And it, and it was no longer a send your call sign, send CQ, 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 call sign twice, and, and then listen. It was, you'd have to send that for a while, and then you'd have to respond for a while so that somebody could actually find you when they were, when they were going up and down your section of the band. Um, but I would sit there at night and I would listen, because we're a seven call area, and I would hear, usually California, I would hear sevens, and then as the night wore on, on 40 meters back then, and 40 meters was the wrong band to be on, quite frankly, at the, at the peak of Solar Cycle 19. The, the 80, and, 80 and 40 worked really well when the sun spot cycle is at the bottom. Um, when the sun size cycle is going up like it is right now, that's when you get 20, you know, 15, 10, and, and 6 meters is, is lit right now. It, it's crazy. Um, so at any rate, um, I would just listen, and all of a sudden I would start hearing zeros. And then I would hear nines, and eventually I would hear fours and threes and twos, because I was getting all the way over now to the East Coast. And what I learned about that early on with that was about propagation, exactly what you're talking about. Um, a lot of people don't like um, uh, UHF, but I'll tell you, inside a building, UHF's going to work a lot better than VHF if you're trying to get out. And so, and so all of those things you need to get out and experiment with so that you start becoming more and more familiar with the propagation cycles or the propagation capabilities of various frequencies at different times of day. And grayscale, all of those other pieces along with that of, of, uh, of, of knowing how to go through that. So no, they don't teach that directly. Um, but what you will find is if you go out to uh, some, uh, DX Heat, some of the other uh, websites that are out there, where, where you can look at propagation and see what's going on, um, you're going you're gonna to find out more and more about how that works. And the other advantage of contesting, and, and I'm also a member of the, the DX, uh, Utah DX Association, um, and I've got just north of 100 entries right now, so I'm not as, as proficient at that as, as some of those members are, but I can still um, um, remember getting some contacts on, on, on ones that were tough to find. Um, and, and what you have to do is you have to listen, you have to know when they're going to be on the air, and then you have to know the time of day that your propagation is working to get down to them. I know that for, for me, the, the um, 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 Eritrea, I think it was, anyway, it's a, it's a small country that's in Africa, that's, that's on the, it's actually on the, uh, on the east coast of Africa, right below the bump. On that, on that east side, they did not allow amateur radio to run in their country. But there's a guy, Tony, from Japan, who was doing a lot of humanitarian work in that country. He got permission to do a de-expedition there and ran a week. I picked him up on the very last day that he was operating, and it wasn't for lack of trying, on 20 meters at 11.35 p.m., and for some reason, 20 meter band opened up into Africa for me at my location right at that time. And, and I was able to pick him up and I, I and actually made that contact on, on voice. It wasn't just CW. Wow. But, but the, point, the point I think I'm trying to make is that it doesn't appear that within the emergency communications community, there's any incentive whatsoever to learn these more basic and fundamental, I don't know what you want, principles of radio communication. It's all focused around emergencies, but this other stuff is like completely left out. And, right. and there's no incentive to learn it. You know, and, and I don't disagree with your point. And, and what I, the thing I would tell you, and, and why contesting is important to some of these others, is because Operating, you start learning those things, and you need to talk to people about that. 
one of the one of the good things about the Utah DX Association, for example, we do a lot of presentations on propagation, sunspot cycles, and, and, and knowing what's going on with that. And the, the other piece that you learn uh, as you build is looking at the propagation differences between a dipole antenna, a Yagi, and others, and know that the and understand some of the concepts, even even of uh, of um, of uh, propagation angle, a angles when you're when it's leaving your antenna, because those antennas are all different, um, and in the way in the way that they work. And if you when you think about when you think about uh, propagation, getting back to this gentleman's point, um, if, if when I'm talking, I, for some reason, from my location, I can I can get to Malaysia. Every morning, or I could about a year ago, on uh, on 40 meters with no problem at all. That's on the other side of the world. But you think about it, and that's not, certainly not line of sight. By the time my signal gets there, I did a calculation one time, and I'm usually be sometimes between five and seven hops away in order to uh, in order to pick up a station that's that far away. And if you're if you're going a long distance, your signal is going up to the to the atmosphere ionosphere and back down again multiple times to do that. And if you just think about something as simple as angle of attack, which will change on the antenna based on height above ground and, and the uh, frequency that you're running and understanding concepts such as maximum usable frequency and all those things, you know, where, what frequencies are actually coming, bouncing off the ionosphere and which ones are not, then that's where you're going to learn that. But nobody teaches that like I, I agree with you. Um, and that might be a good thing to have in your club on a regular basis is having some presentations on propagation, what works, and, uh, and and how it works, so that you can you can do that. Yes, sir. I just want to say, those are things that we're looking at training within the Weber County Area Group. Mm -hmm. We do want to increase that knowledge in those training levels. I don't have a whole lot of radio experience myself. Um, I'm just renewing my license right now, 10 years. Um, but I work a full-time job, I've got kids. We're, we're all in different stages of our lives and our learning levels. If that's something you have a knowledge in, and you're willing to share that with the Aries group, contact me. We want that training, we want that knowledge within the groups as well. So if that's something you're willing to do, please contact me. We'll invite you out, give you a little bit of time in one of our training meetings, and let's get that knowledge spread, because there's a wealth of knowledge in this room that I don't have, and I know that. But I'm not. I need other people to teach me as well. <laughs> well, and, and I'll and I'll tell you if you ever want me to come back and do a propagation, I, I would love to put one of those together because it's 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 a it, it is an interesting an interesting thing to look at. Yeah, and, uh, and and know how how signals move around when they work well and when they don't. And that's one of the other things to think about. I mean, if, for example, if you take a look at even the Saturn net that we talked about before, when you look at that one. Um, you will see that at, at night they'll be on 40 meters and during the day they're on 20. And that's because that's the better propagation model for them to get messages across the country at that time. And that's why traffic nets have got different frequencies that they cover at different times. And so, and right now TWNCW is on 80 meters um, at night, um, and, but that's all close communication and that works well. But um, other times during the day, they're on 40 meters, or they've got options to be on 20 as well. So that's a good comment, and I appreciate you making that, because it is an important aspect of, of radio that uh, I felt fortunate because I was learning all this electronic stuff when I was in high school, and, uh, and getting an amateur radio license was just an add-on benefit. Any other questions before I give this microphone back to Craig? And thank you for the comment on the, on the propagation. Okay. Thank you, Rick. And before you leave me, we're going to give you a badge because we appreciate so much what you've done for us. And you will be welcome back. And we will have at least two more. We're going to talk about traffic system and propagation one of these days. And thank you for this. Absolutely. Congratulations again on your 100 years. That's awesome. I think we've got some work to do to keep our legacy going, but you raised a couple of issues that are really important to me and I hope to all of us. And the first one is 
there's no one organization doing everything that could be done or needs to be done. And we need each of us doing our piece. I kind of look at the club as being one of the places where a lot of training can happen and it happens right in these meetings. We only have three or four meetings a year where we actually do this kind of training because we're out at field day, we're out, you know, doing special events, um, we're doing other things, we're having elections and eating, we're having a Christmas party and eating, uh, we seem to like to eat a lot, uh, there's donuts back there, please eat them. Okay, just, just wanted to get that in there. But I look at the club as being one place where we can do some of this training and, and need to, to help hone our skills. We've got our Aries group, and Brad's here representing them. You'll see a few of the Aries members here with us today who are also members of our club, and we appreciate them so much. And everybody is always welcome to be a part of us. I'm wearing an Aries hat today not because I'm part of Weber Aries, because I am not part of Weber Aries. I'm part of Davis Aries. I'm an assistant emergency coordinator for Leighton City. I have a relationship with Leighton City. Every Thursday night at 7 o'clock, 7.30, the county does our Aries net, and that's what happens down there. At 8.15, Leighton City does another net for their neighborhoods with four FCC approved channels that they've, frequencies that they've purchased. And we're trying to use that through our CERT program to be able to have reach into the neighborhoods, get it back, they call it Oxcom, and then have that connected to our uh, ACC, which is the dispatch system. All of us can do those things. I would invite you, please, do what you can in the community where you're at to build some relationships so that if they need us, we would be available. A second, the task book. I've got it. I've got, I'm at uh, level two and a half. I've taken the EC001 course, which was great. It has several um, of the ICS courses in it. I have actually completed the coursework for the 016 course. I'm working on all of the extra ICS courses that are part of that. These are not classes you do in a weekend. They're going to take you a month or two or three, and they're intended to be that way so they can sink in. And that's great information, so I second everything that uh, Rick shared with us on those. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever get to talk to the section manager and say, please give me the exam, because my, my brain doesn't retain information for you about anymore. But um, thank you everybody for coming today. And thank Rick so much for coming and being with us. Please talk to Gary, who's our program director, about things like, I'd really like a presentation on propagation. I'd like a presentation on national traffic system. I'd like a presentation on putting a field thing together. Now next month, right here, bring your show and tell. If you've got a field, something that you'd like to bring in. Now we may not be able to put a 160 meter antenna in this room, but it'd be interesting to try it. Um, bring your stuff. Let's see where we're at. Share with each other so we can learn. Is there any other things we'd like to bring up today before we go? Wow, we're all stunned. <laughs> Great presentation. Let's give uh, Rick one more big thanks. Bring your goodies next time so we can share with everybody. Take a donut on your way out, and thank you. We'll see you next month.